Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our witnesses who have joined us for our inquiry into Scotland's economic performance. Um, we have today, looking from my left to my right, um, first of all, Jackie Briarton, who is the Vice Chair of Women's Enterprise Scotland and Enterprise and the CEO of GrowBiz. Um, then Jim McCall, who is the Founder, Chairman and CEO of Clyde Blowers Capital. Uh, then Dr. Suzanne Mawson, who is a lecturer in management, work and organisation at the University of Stirling. And last but not least, Sandy Kennedy, Chief Executive of Entrepreneurial Scotland. So welcome to all of you this morning. Thank you for coming in. And if I might start with a question, uh, the panel members may be aware it's not necessary to come in on every question, but we try to allow... Uh, things to flow and uh, feel free to indicate by raising your hand if you wish to come in at point in the discussion if you haven't already. So we'll start with a question from me and then move to questions from the other committee members and what I would like to ask the panel about is how they see the Scottish economy as having performed over the past 10 years and in particular how do they view the developments in entrepreneurship in Scotland over that time period and business growth. Uh, so I'm not sure who would like to start off from the panel. Um, Dr. Suzanne Mawson. Sure, happy to start. Um, well, from my perspective, I, I think we've seen quite a positive development in terms of, of entrepreneurial activity and I think as well awareness and interest in, in entrepreneurship. Um, I think a lot of this has been uh, a sustained rhetoric within policy but also within the wider media uh, and, and then the development of, of other organisations as represented here um, in, in terms of building this awareness. I think we still have a, a, a bit of work to do. Uh, I know we don't have the most recent figures on business creation in Scotland. Uh, I think the latest GEM report was 2014, where we did lag in Scotland behind the um, wider UK. And I think there's, again, room for, for improvement to, to be developing um, entrepreneurial intention and new venture creation within Scotland. Um, Part of that, I think, is about building confidence. Um, and if we look at the GEM figures, I think for me, the big thing that's come out is, is a gap in terms of people's perceptions of the skills and the abilities that they have to be able to start a business. And, and working at a university, I, I see this quite often. There's such strong interest in, in starting businesses and almost a, a, a worry that um, individuals will be unable to actually do that. And I think if we want to continue our, our positive trend and, and see even more businesses started, more entrepreneurial activity in Scotland, this is perhaps a, a place that we can start by, by building um, that, that understanding of, of skills and, and knowledge needed to, to be able to start businesses. Jackie Briarton. Yes, good morning. Um, I think following on from Suzanne, I would say uh, um, if I focus on the two areas that I'm particularly interested and p potentially knowledgeable about is um, gender, women's enterprise and also rural enterprise. And I think looking back over the last 10 years, we've seen some progress in the number of women starting and growing business in Scotland. But I don't think we've taken advantage of the huge potential that there is to grow that 20% uh, that's the current current figure. And in a rural context, I think we've actually probably sadly neglected a lot of our rural economy, given that compared to urban, rural is particularly dominated by small and micro businesses. And the rate of self-employment is more than double that of urban. We haven't actually provided the kind of support that these small and micro businesses really need to grow, because after all, they're the pipeline to become the SMEs of the future. So I think those are two areas that I think there's lots of potential going forward if we can have a more gendered and uh, rural uh, proofing approach to both of those. Thank you. And Sandy Kennedy. Um, so thinking about the last 10 years, we can go, I think we should be looking to data. So there's a question about how good is the data that we've got as our performance and what data do we need looking forward for the next 10 years to make us not only understand how well we're doing, but also which bits are working, which bits aren't. Um, so just looking backwards at the data over the last 10 years, we have a GDP growth, which has been relatively weak. 
um, both in Scot Scottish terms but also against the UK. We have an improving productivity performance, um, but again, still relatively weak, only just into the second quartile. Um, our uh, higher education R&D is good, but our business R&D is right down in the fourth quartile. So there's some pretty tough, maybe mixed message um, hard data. I think in terms of looking at other sources of data that we do have, um, in terms of those organisations that scale up, um, and this is, you know, see it as a, an indicator rather than uh, something that's um, you know, thoroughly researched, but if you look at the top 50 firms in the Insider 500, the most recently created firm was founded in 1985, and that was um, City Refrigeration by Lord Willie Hockey. So we have not created a firm in this country that can get into the top 50 for, since 1985 for 32 years. That's got to ask significant questions, and that's despite, obviously, a, a strong focus on, on high growth. Similarly, when you look at the landscape of entrepreneurial leaders uh, from startups, but right through to scale-ups, the number of female founders that we have um, and female CEOs is, a, I don't have the exact percentage because I don't believe it's available, but it's very low number. So I think there's a, there's a, a, a key point there about latent potential, and I think overarching and I think we can look at the hard data from the past we can look at some of those more specific point data from insider etc but the key thing is is perhaps how we feel and that that feeling is Scotland has much more potential than perhaps we're realizing and we could be looking around and going this is something that um we could accept as being this is just the norm this is where we are this is where an industrialized co economy um at the top of Europe really should be but in the people that I spend a lot of time with, they believe that Scotland has got huge potential and we're not fulfilling it. And that, to me, is the more pressing challenge, which is how do we unlock that potential across a whole manner of different ways? May I ask, uh, does that relate also to the, the question of the rate of business, um, startups, business growth? So I think that there's two different th points in there. Um, firstly, the rates of startup, yes, will, will ebb and flow and has ebbed and flowed over many decades. The issue I, I have is that we need to do both. We need to keep that sort of that top of the hopper startup flow coming in. But really it's about how do we then move that to, to create jobs. And we create jobs by growing firms, by exporting by um, increasing uh, the, the talent flows that are going uh, amongst those organizations. So yes, startups are important, and yes, we should try that number, but that it's illusory to just look at that number alone. We should be looking at how firms are growing and then how they're exporting and how good we are at, at creating new jobs. Uh, Jim McCall. <coughs> yeah, I, I think there's um, certainly been a lot of um, uh, more interest in, in entrepreneurial activity and people trying to start their own businesses over the past 10 years. But I think it's been driven by a lack of opportunity for high quality jobs and people are being forced into looking at that rather than doing it as a first choice. And I think it's a good thing that they're looking at it. Um, you know, if I look at the decade before that, 97 to 2007, that was a much uh, more golden era for Scotland. There were a lot of businesses grew, um, a lot of entrepreneurs came to fore and encouraged others. And, you know, if you ask why has it changed, and I think it's down to the support for growth and the support for businesses, including micro-businesses and M M SMEs, has disappeared. We don't have the support uh, structure that we need. Um, before 2007, we had good support from mainly two of the Scottish banks. And, you know, you might get the, the quip back, well, that's how they got in trouble. It's not how they got in trouble. They gave very good support to small businesses, which they don't give now. Um, they're very restricted in, in uh, the support they can give, and they've pulled back quite a bit. Um, so that, that support's not there for small businesses um, or for businesses that are growing. Exporting is what we want to, you know, we want to encourage our, our SMEs to export. The export finance system that's in place doesn't support SMEs. There is theoretically a UK support system there, um, which says that the government will, will um, underwrite 80% of the export finance. 
but if it's got to be done through one of the big banks. And if you go to them, they'll say that's all very well, but we want additional security as well. So you can, as an SME, get the support to do the exports. We do quite a bit of work in, um, in um, Finland, and the National Investment Bank there, uh, Finvera, is very supportive of, uh, of small and medium-sized businesses. We've, we've been the beneficiary of that. And um, I think the statistic is, in absolute terms, they've given more export finance support to their companies uh, three times the amount of the UK. And that's a, that's a country that's 5.5 million. They also have a very good infrastructure for supporting startups, uh, supporting growth companies through their National Investment Bank. And I know we're looking through the government here at a National Investment Bank. My worry is that we kind of half cook it and don't do the proper support, which gets round um, claims from Europe on state aid. Every other country in Europe has a National Investment Bank that's set up to get round state aid. Um, they also can raise their own finance off, balance, off of the government's balance sheet on the bank's balance sheet. They can raise bonds to support small companies. Um, the, the problem we have here is that if you raise it in the UK, it goes on to the national debt. It doesn't go on to the national debt in any other European country because the banks are set up in a way that they're financed separately, they're commercial entities owned by the government, and they actually make money for the government. So, you know, you can raise money, support your infrastructure programmes, your small businesses, your growing businesses, um, and you can do import substitution. Because if I'm competing against a Polish or a German or another European country, bidding for local work, as, as I do in my shipyard, then um, I'm, it's an uneven playing field. I don't have the support to put in place the guarantees that the Germans and the, um, the Poles and then every other European country has. And that's why we have a very weak industrial base. Sure. Um, John Mason, just on that point. Thanks. It was just to, to press you on that point you made about the other countries' national investment banks. Um, are you saying that in the UK we couldn't set up a bank that was completely off balance sheet? or Because it's the European rules at the moment, at least, I think, that govern all these things. Or are you saying that we're not planning to set up one that's off balance sheet? You know, you very, you very often get um, the quip that, um, yeah, we're the only ones that stick to the rules and all the others, the French cheat and the challenge cheat and everybody else cheats. They don't cheat. There is a method to do it and we can do it, we have chosen not to do it. Or the politicians in the UK and in Scotland. That Scotland, you've probably been... Um, it's been more difficult because you're governed by the UK rules on debt, the amount of debt you're allowed to raise. But arguably, if you set up a separate investment bank, it should be outside those rules because every other country goes and raises it on, you know, on, on the markets. And because it's government-backed, you can borrow at low rates, and then you're lending on and giving guarantees to companies um, to support their growth. But you're charging a bit more than you're actually paying for your, your bond. And, you know, I had commissioned a, a report from University College London recently in this, and some astonishing facts came out. Uh, one which um, I, th I thought was really quite surprising was if you look at Germany, their national investment bank, KFW, um, if you put their debt that they raise in the bank onto the German national debt, they would be the third most indebted nation in Europe after Greece and Lithuania. Um, but it's not part of national debt and it shouldn't be viewed that way. We can choose to do it here. Um, but we need to be, um, you know, we need to be ambitious enough to do it properly. And, you know, I just hope that with the National Investment Bank we're setting up here, that we're ambitious enough and we make sure 
that it can get round European rules and that we don't have state aid rules um, held up. Because, you know, we are going to do, we're obviously going to have some sort of trading relationship with, um, with Brexit. Um, so there's going to be state aid rules. If there's a trade agreement of any sorts, there's going to be state aid rules. Now you need an investment bank like this more than ever. Thank you. We'll move on to a question from Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much. The, the remit of this inquiry is as much to look forward as to look um, back. And, and Jim, you've already talked about some of the challenges in terms of investing in the, in the economy. But I'm just wondering if panel members could give us some sense of the key challenges and risks that they see facing the Scottish economy and businesses over the next 10 years. First up, so in terms of um, the talent pool that we have to enable businesses to grow, we have the Scale Up Institute who have done research both for the UK and um, for Scotland, and they highlight that scaling businesses, their biggest barrier to growth is access to talent. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we run a, a programme where we have 18 businesses who are at the lower end of scaling, but have got ambition to scale into 50 to 100 million. They say that their number one issue is access to talent. And even in that group, they have currently around 50 positions vacant. Um, I look to, um, there's a recent report out uh, from the Fraser Valander, again, that Highland highlighted recruitment and specific issues there. So, so there's clearly a skills um, and talent issue there. Um, I think clearly with Brexit, there's going to be, that's potentially even worse uh, because a, a lot of particularly our tech and technology and life science firms have enjoyed a flow of talent coming in from Europe and that will well, is at the best is uncertain, so uh, that, that creates issues. So I think access um, to talent is really important. I think it's important to emphasise, I suppose, a, a side issue to that as well, is we run the Salter Scholar Intern Programme, and we've had um, nearly 1,500 applicants for that uh, this year. We've interviewed seven, uh, 600 people in the last few weeks. The quality of young people coming through at that end is really, really good. We do have some very high quality people coming through. So we've got to be careful we don't swing too far the other way. But if they're looking for their opportunities in London or New York or into Europe or around the world, then we've also got to make sure there's transparency between the opportunities that exist in Scotland with the young, the, you know, some of our best young talent that's coming through, and I don't believe that's happening at the moment. Jackie Brereton. I think if you, going, going back to the data question that Sandy mentioned earlier, if you look at the trends over the last 10 years, the only growth area uh, analytically has been growth in self-employment and unregistered businesses. And therefore, in the next 10 years, the only or, or one of the key ways we're going to get the economy to grow is to work with these self-employed people and unregistered businesses and help those that want to grow to get to the next stage. And there's some challenges there, which I'll come back to. So, for example, um, Women's Enterprise Scotland has surveyed women business owners several times over the last few years, and 87% of them want to grow. So there's obvious potential there. But they don't necessarily want to grow in the same way as the agencies um, are stipulating that they need to grow in order to get support. So, for example, I think to access the pipeline support, you need to be um, targeting... Uh, 400,000 increase in turnover over 18 months, two years, somewhere around those lines. For a lot of women, that is not that is not feasible or sustainable. They're often starting from a part-time basis. They're often balancing other responsibilities, and they want to grow, but they want to grow organically. So, to take advantage of the opportunities and the potential over the next 10 years, I think we have to have a fundamental relook at the way that we support businesses at that early stage and how we actually help the micro and small businesses to get to the next stage. Because once they're past startup, unless they fulfill the criteria for high growth support, there's nothing for them. We've got a vast array of missing middle businesses in Scotland who literally can't access support. Uh, but I think one of the other huge challenges is, is digital. So it's an enormous opportunity 
the if we reach the target we're setting in 2021 so that every business every household can access high speed broadband that's going to increase the number of micro businesses who can actually operate really efficiently they can they can actually use e-commerce to expand they can do all sorts of things that they couldn't have done 10 15 years ago and yet, if you look at some of the recent stats, less than a third of our businesses are using digital at the moment for cloud computing, CRM, data analysis. There's still a third of businesses that don't have any digital presence at all. And it's almost as if the, the ability, the digital ability and resource that's going to be available to businesses is going to be um, lost because we don't have either the skills or the confidence within the business community to use that resource um, to its fullest extent. And even that ambition to have high-speed broadband, we're still only talking about an average of 24 megs. You know, South Korea, practically their only priority within their economic development strategy is that every single business should have access to one gigabyte. If we had something ambitious like that in Scotland, we could transform the economy in the next 10 years, in my opinion. Uh, Jim McCall. Um, as Sandy mentioned, the, uh, the access to talent. I think we produce a lot of really good talent here, but we don't produce the opportunities for them, so we, use, we lose them. I mean, I'm a supporter of, of Entrepreneurial Scotland. We've supported some of the, um, the young people coming through, and I've spoken to them after they've been through the course, and they're buzzing with energy. And my big fear is they'll go into a company and they'll get it knocked out of them. They're enthusiastic. They want to be doing things. And I don't think we... I don't think we... The fundamental problem is we need to produce more high-quality jobs that are well-paid and can, and can provide a career path for people. You know, we don't, we're, we're producing low-cost jobs just now. Unemployment is low, but it's the quality of the jobs are not what we really want here, I don't think. And productivity is another issue that comes up, and it's always linked back to R&D. In my view, productivity, it, it may have a, a small connection to R&D, but the two big factors, or three big pa factors, I think, in productivity are happiness at work, security, and fair pay. And if people have the, those three things, surprisingly, productivity goes up. I've experienced it in my own businesses. It shoots up, and it's got nothing to do with us plugging in a lot more R&D. So we need to be focusing on higher quality jobs, fair pay and security. And, and then I think the productivity follows. And that's all about the support that, that, that Jackie's saying is needed for these smaller businesses. It's just not there. And you're kind of um, muscle bound in a lot of the entities you have to support businesses. I've tried it with a couple of things and you get to a blank, a dead end, well, it doesn't really fit the criteria for how we can support you. You know, it's it's we need to have a more flexible approach, and I think um, there are ways we can do that. Um, before I bring in Dr. Mawson, uh, Julian Martin had a follow-up on one of the points uh, raised. So um, I'm very interested to hear what you're saying around about skills. One of the things that I I've been aware of is as a former further education lecturer myself, is that you've got a lot of young people who are doing the type of courses which would lead, lend themselves to setting up in business, for example, hair and beauty, creative industries, but there doesn't seem to be a lot in place in the curriculum for actually giving them the tools to set up in business. Has that been your experience, that, you know, we, that we may be missing a trick by not having those, and also, I was in a school yesterday, and one of the kids in fourth year said that one of the most useful things they could learn in school will be how to fill in your tax return. Um, you know, and this is the 30th of January, so obviously it's quite a, I'm real keenly interested in that right now. But has that been your experience as well? It's like, in terms of there's the skills to do jobs, but there's also the tools to make confident entrepreneurs, because I think at the moment people are falling in to self-employment, like Jackie said, rather than looking at it as an actual goal. I want to be an employer. I want to set up in business. 
I'm happy to go. Just it's really a, an addendum <laughs> to that, which is that um, one of the biggest influences of young people, actually of all of us, is what our peer group are doing and then what people we come into contact with. So when we look at young people coming through schools or in colleges or in universities or, or not even um, you know, apprentices or whatever, the quality of contact that they have uh, is really important. So if you take an example of a school, that example, the fourth year that you mentioned earlier, is if they are being taught and the only person that's influencing them is someone who's actually never worked in the workplace or has never had experience of that, it's going to be either at best abstract and at worst ill-informed. So the more that we can get and the boundaries between schools and colleges and the business community in particular um, much more porous, the better. And, um, and Jim probably can talk to this very powerfully, particularly the, with the work that he's been doing uh, in Glasgow with, with your school, is that th when you get young people engaging with uh, people who are, who've got all sorts of backgrounds, who maybe didn't go to university and have done phenomenally well, or have got the ambition to start a business and sell into another country, then it really affects those young people. And therefore, programmes like Founders for Schools, Young Enterprise Scotland, who are doing that, we need to really get into that. But we need to do it together. So it's not that there's a, a, it's like a pocket of uh, schools over here and business over here and the public sector over here and the health service over here. We need to start working much more together. Also, with the, you mentioned R&D is very good in universities but not so good in businesses who's facilitating the facilitating the the merging of business into universities is anyone taking responsibility for there that are is organizations broken? like interface who who are looking at that but i would look at it maybe a wee bit more holistically and saying what is the driver for somebody taking all that r&d into universities and you know, somebody with the data would be able to be able to say it better, but I suspect the driver is because you've got many academics who want to get their academic research funded. Their goal isn't to start a business. Their goal isn't to, to connect back into business. So it then ends up being siloed. Whereas if you look at the, the, the fancily named the HERD and data versus the BRD, we're in the top quarter for higher education R&D and we're in the bottom quartile for business R&D. That says to me there's a massive gap going on between them. There's a disconnect. And if you look then at the amount of money, and again, I don't have the, the, the sort of broken down numbers, but currently Scottish government invests £2 billion a year in economic development and R&D and support skills for the economy. You've got to be looking at where's the return on that investment? Thank you. Thank you. want to come back in on that and then back to Andy Whiteman. I wanted to come back on, on the skills. I think that's a really critical point. And for me, this is maybe where we have our biggest stumbling block. I see every day so many young people who are really passionate about doing something for themselves, about starting a business, even about working in a, a, a young or um, young venture or, or an SME. And very often I see this confidence issue. And I think it's because we are great in terms of having that dialogue about entrepreneurship as um, uh, a potential career choice, if we can say, but we're not necessarily so great at actually giving them the, the tangible training or tools that they can build on and, and, and really engage initially and develop their confidence from there. Um, I think we've seen a huge development in terms of what's available at school, um, elementary school, high school level, in colleges, at universities. Things, even in the last five years, are so much better. But again, I think we've got work to be done. And I think it's finding a balance between giving them a chance to be inspired. And I think that's where we, we need to have, have, have business people coming into to institutions, into schools, into universities to share their, their experience, to build that passion and, and that enthusiasm. But then moving beyond that as well and, and giving concrete education that gives specific tools. So you know, beyond just even business planning, thinking about the tax return, thinking about other specific elements that may help in terms of not only starting a business, but then potentially giving them a platform for, for development and for growth later on. So I think there, there's lots of potential there, but, but it is fair to say as well that, that we have come a long way, even in the last five years. So we're on a positive trajectory, even if we've got some, some areas for improvement. Um, <clears throat> just coming back to my original question, the, um, I think, uh, Jackie, you were saying that you, we need to 
get self-employed people to the next stage. Uh, Jim had mentioned something about self-employment in an earlier question. My understanding is a lot of self-employment is not through choice, it's through uh, necessity. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can um, say a little bit more about the extent to which you think self-employment, as it currently exists, can actually move on to create bigger businesses. And you mentioned also the inappropriate level of support um, uh, uh, that, that was available, um, particularly for women. Do you have any sense of what the latent capacity in the economy is there that we're missing out on? Okay. Um, so from a self-employment perspective, I think statistically, and, and certainly GEM measures this opportunity versus necessity, an opportunity outplays necessity. Undoubtedly, there are people in the economy who, choose self who don't choose self-employment as their first priority. But in rural areas, often there's no choice. So instead of saying, well, they don't, they're doing it because they have to, so we shouldn't be helping them, we should actually be engaging with them and finding out how we can support them to build a stronger um, way of employment, even if it ends up they're only creating their own job. That is still valuable, particularly in a rural context. And I think, you know, I, I work, we, Grobe is, um, which operates in Perth, rural Perthshire, it's, it's the only model of its kind in Scotland because we're a community-based enterprise support organisation, we're independent, and we provide it very much from, provide the support very much from a perspective of helping the businesses to engage with each other, support each other, it's a peer support model, there's a mentoring programme within it. There's a whole lot of different ways that we support um, uh, the businesses, which ends up becoming a very sustainable local economy because they all feel part of a community of business, which is really important in terms of their sustainability. And the survivability rates are really high. The last time we measured, there was over 90% of the businesses we've worked with in the last five years still operating. Now, they might be just one, two, three people. In a rural context, that is really critical because if you multiply that, the multiplier effect of having 100 businesses turning over 30, 40, 50,000 in a rural context is actually worth much more than having three, four, five million pound turnover. Um, which would be unusual in most most rural areas. Coming back to the actual support, then um, I think, in a, again, from a rural perspective, at the self-employment and micro-business level, the only source of support in most areas is Business Gateway. And Business Gateway is very centralised, so they very rarely provide outreach support or go to, to, to where people need. But probably more importantly, they also don't really value, I think, most self-employed um, occupations. So they dismiss businesses too readily. And we have many clients coming to us as Grobers saying that they've been to Business Gateway but told that they're they're not really they're not worth well basically that they're not worthy of support, which I think is appalling because we are putting off so many people who have got that potential. Now, it's not necessarily the business gateway operator's fault that that's happening. The business gateway, the, the contract is, I think, not fit for purpose in today in 2018. It's an approach that we were, it's very similar to the approach we were taking 15, 20 years ago to supporting business. It's a transactional approach. It's minimal. Um, it misses out, I think, on a lot of opportunity and potential because of the way it works. And I don't think it's the contractors or the operators' fault. I think we just need to rethink that. And perhaps controversially, I would say, through the Enterprise and Skills Review, we missed an opportunity to review how that worked, because to me, that would have been a chance to actually take a more radical approach to how we support business. And it's, it's not about that that is more costly. Um, we've costed out how Globus operates. We've supported 300 businesses in the last year. It works out around seven or eight hundred pounds a business, and the business gateway cost is around eleven, twelve hundred pounds a business. So it's not about cost. You can create a really effective relational model of business support that works. Um, and if you do it in a facilitative way at a local level, it doesn't need to cost um, a lot of money. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and now John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I'd like to focus on the, the whole question of uh, growing businesses. And I mean, I look at the business pay 
pages of the Herald sometimes and some small growing business has sold itself to Microsoft or Google or some huge international organization and that's seen as a success and a few people have made quite a lot of money. I always feel disappointed when I read that kind of story because I feel, sure, could that company not have grown more as a Scottish company with its headquarters in Scotland? Uh, I mean, we've talked already about maybe there's not enough support for small businesses to grow. So it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it not a bad thing when we sell off all our small companies? Is it a lack of confidence in the part of the people running the companies? Or is it a lack of support from the public sector? Ms. Mawson, Dr. Mawson. Yeah, I, I think you raise a really interesting point, and this is something that, that's also been a bugbear for me personally over, over the last few years watching um, the, the media footage. When we look at our, our high growth business base in Scotland, we've got about um, 1,500 high growth firms at, at any given point in time. And I'm always surprised just how quickly that stock replenishes itself. So, so for example, a couple of years ago, I, I did um, a small study looking at eight companies, and within three years, all eight high growth firms had been acquired by large multinationals. And I think we have an, a number of, of factors at play. It is a, a, a very good um, thing for, for the owners of the business to be able to, to sell out, um, to, to be able to move on. For me, the question would be less about uh, the, the rationale for that decision, and, and I'm not sure how effective policy would be in, in terms of making what, what is a very personal decision at, on, on the part of a business owner, but the issue of embeddedness. So how can we actually keep businesses growing in Scotland for as long as possible to avoid a, a, a branch plant economy where we maybe keep a head office um, as, a, as a business is acquired, and also to embed CEOs, uh, managing directors, their, their employee base as well within Scotland so that, that we have a, a desire for people to stay here to be able to continue to grow businesses and if an acquisition were to happen and a business were to be sold, how do we make sure that we have, um, and, and I know the academic term is, is kind of silly, entrepreneurial recycling, how do we make sure that we get serial entrepreneurs, people who are, are reinvesting in new business creation in Scotland time and time again rather than going down to, to other ecosystems or, or down to London uh, and, and I think these, these are critical issues. Support might be part of it and I strongly suspect that if you are getting, um, well, given given the, the nature of support through the enterprise agencies, if you are trying to meet those growth targets year on year on year for support, you are probably then building for growth for sale. Um, and, and, and I wonder if maybe that's, that's part of, of the issue there, having such discrete targets may lead for an exit strategy, um, or, or, or again may, may um, make companies be uh, more, more visible to uh, potential buyers um, from outside of, of the UK or, or even in the UK itself. But I, I think maybe if, if we focus on, on this issue of, of, of embeddedness and really trying to get individuals and their organisations to, to see the benefit of staying and growing in Scotland for, for however long that may be, I think we'd end up in a much better situation than we are in currently where we're giving an awful lot of funding to very, very promising early stage businesses tons and tons and tons of support, financial and otherwise, only to then help the line the pockets of big multinationals and to give away our IP and our um, um, other benefits that I think should be, should be kept here and, and should be benefiting Scotland and the Scottish economy. Um, I, I think that's a very healthy part of the whole entrepreneurial cycle. What we're missing is stronger businesses based in Scotland they can buy those smaller businesses. Um, and, you know, that's the whole tier that we're missing out here. The bigger businesses that can take them to the next stage are elsewhere. We don't have the businesses that can then say, OK, I'll take this business that's been grown very strongly and it's a great business and it's got a good future. But the commitment to finance that going on is, is big. And some people aren't up for the risk of that. And, you know... It, it plays into the support, the other kind of support that's that's um, not here in Scotland to go to that next level. So you know, I th I think we have to break the break the the kind of logjam here and and try and get businesses grow a, a, a tier of businesses that are um, bigger businesses that can take the smaller ones or the medium sized ones on to the next stage but they've got to be based here, they've got to be Scottish businesses. We haven't broken through that, and we're in danger of not breaking through if we don't put in place the infrastructure 
to get above that level so that we create, again, it's back to creating good quality businesses with high quality jobs um, to retain the talent. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not rocket science. Can I just ask one, just to follow up on the points just made uh, by both of you, um, is it slightly more complex than that because it's not just about the company and the, um, the actual ownership? So selling a company to a large multinational um, doesn't mean that the, the money paid for that leaves Scotland. <coughs> and I'm just thinking of a company that where a similar situation occurred, but the people that have the money now wish to invest that back into Scottish companies. So there's the, the aspect of the, the capital, whether or not the intention is that that then is put back into business or not. And is that something that can be measured? Um, because it's, it's also about the capital and where the money that comes from the sale is then invested into. Because if that is then invested back into Scotland to grow new businesses, it's not lost in that sense. I appreciate that the ongoing profitability of the company that has sold may be. But is that part of that scenario? Be, to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure of any data sources that would be able to, to track that at this point in time, but I don't see that it's something that couldn't be, have, have systems put in place to try and measure. And, and I agree, if, if you could determine exactly how much of that money was recycled within Scotland, that would give a far more accurate picture as to whether anything is, is really, really lost or, or whether we're just seeing a, a, a bit of recycling and, and rejigging. There are, there are some data sources. Uh, Young Company Finance, for instance, uh, tracks all deals that are done uh, in the high growth sector. So uh, I know that they, they would be able to get to that data out of thought pretty quickly. Uh, just to, to re-emphasize, I think points that have already been made, but I think worthy of repeating, which are that there are different types of sale. There's the sales where we sell businesses, say, for 20 million, where they've got a latent potential to be a 200 million pound business within the Scottish context, or, or maybe even more. And therefore, that's a lost opportunity to Scotland. And therefore, you ask the question about why does that happen? Yeah, often confidence, often the sort of the, the peer support that sits around them, then that's, that's what success looks like. Whereas in parts of America or Asia, 20 million pounds, you still are the, you're a distant hundredth in your local area as to how well you've done, et cetera. So there is a, there's a sense there. But really... Um, does it matter what sector you're in? I mean, IT it varies, is maybe more yeah. centralised worldwide. I, I don't know. So would it, is it harder to grow an IT company to that kind of size than so, other companies? So I would say if you take Skyscanner as an example, um, and I would see that as a positive sale given where Scotland has been in the past, in that it was venture capital backed out of Scotland by SEP. It had founders that were based and live and still live in Scotland. Um, the shareholders, a lot of employees, took a lot of money out of that sale and therefore are recycling that finance. Um, in terms of the talent, the quality of jobs that they created was excellent, and therefore a number of them are staying within the Skyscanner group. But a number of them have gone and started new ventures as well and are mentoring and um, going on boards of other ventures. So the net effect, that, that recycling effect, not just of cash, but of talent, expertise, and connections, is, I think, in Sky Center, will, and the truth will be told in the next two or three years, could be very profound. However, we contrast that with a business, an engineering business, which maybe was located here, grew here, and has been taken out. The senior team have been taken out, and at best, there's a, a small... Um, sort of a sales office still based here, and, and at worst even than that is there's nothing, then the value of recycling to Scotland is close to nothing. And then when you layer on top of that how they've had the support, and if there's a number in um, some sectors like life sciences can be more prone to this, where they take on a lot of government support through smart grants, through R&D grants, through et cetera, et cetera, if you aggregate it up where they've got their capital from, then the government, the public sector has paid a lot into that. But actually when the returns come, the public sector gets none of that back again. Could I continue? I mean, Mr McCall's point about we need some bigger companies in Scotland that potentially could take over and do other things. I mean, are other countries getting that right or get it, doing it better? I mean, we hear about Germany sometimes and the banks seem to be a bit more local and they support local businesses. Are there other countries we can look to for that kind of example? Most other countries in Europe you can look to for that example. Um, I mean, one that I, that we're involved in and is a similar size to Scotland is Finland. 
And they've got many big companies in Finland. If you look at Norway as well, you know, um, it's... <sighs> I, th I think it comes down to the infrastructure to support the companies. And at the core of that is their national investment banks, which work with what they call patient capital. There's too many, you know, short-term goals here in the, in the public sector, for example, where, you know, public markets, where it's all about next month's performance and... Uh, there are all sorts of ways to get the share price up, you know, buying back shares, not putting it back into the company. There's, there's, you need patient capital behind it, and all of these countries have it. And, and in addition to that, you need other things. I mean, at the moment, we're raising a debt fund, which is going to plug a, a gap from 5 to 15 million in lending. But I'm also in the process of starting up a new Scottish bank. And, well pulling together a consortium to support small and um, micro companies. And um, that bank will end up to £5 million initially. Um, we have to apply for the licence. It's 18 months away, but we're about to start it, I think, in March, start the process. Um, but I, I approached the Scottish Government about, look, how can you help do this? And there's no way for them to help us do it. Now, this is... I'm not doing it to make money out of the small bank. I'm doing it because there's a real need, I think, in Scotland for support for these small companies. And it's not it's not being delivered by the existing government agencies or by um, the banks. There's a, there's a big gap there. And there are thousands of companies that we've identified that, can, that need access to this kind of support. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Quick follow-ups from Alec Neil and then Dean Lockhart. Okay, uh, can I say I can think of a number of ways in which the Scottish Government could help you, and I think you need to go back to them, Jim, because they're a wee bit of a imagination, and this is something they should be totally supportive of, in my view. Well, <coughs> the, the, the vehicles that they have are only there if we can't get the capital elsewhere, and the, the, the response to me was, you'll find a way to do it. You know, and uh, I mean... I, I just think we need we need a more collaborative approach Absolutely. to these things rather than, um, well, you, you know, you go in and try and do something. We need a more collaborative yeah. approach. Um, can, can I ask more generally, both of what you've said, which I totally agree with, and what Jackie has said about how, I mean, Sandy made the point the Scottish government is spending £2 billion a year at the moment on economic development. What return are we getting for that? Um, and Jackie, I think, rightly made the point, and you at a national level made the point in relation to the National Investment Bank, are, are delivery mechanisms maybe part of the problem now, that they are out of date, they're no longer fit for purpose. And I'm not being critical of Scottish Enterprise or High or anyone else particularly, but I, I was a, the founding chief executive of the Prince's Scottish Youth Business Trust, and one of the benefits of that was we were not a government agency. And therefore, we set the rules, minimum bureaucracy, uh, business people were the ones involved in making the decisions and deciding whether a business plan was viable or not. So my question is, uh, and, and you know, I often used to think if a Tom Farmer went along to Business Gateway, and certainly if he went along to one of the high growth support units, he would have been chased away because he would not have been perceived to have been a high growth potential. Uh, many retailers uh, would have been in the same position, um, I, I suspect maybe Amazon, uh, if they'd gone to Business Gateway or to Scottish Enterprise, would have been sent packing as well. So it, it seems to me from one of the things you're saying, there's a lot of things that we need to change, but one of the things we need to change is the whole delivery mechanism to make it much more flexible, much freer of government, much more imaginative and dynamic than I think it now is. I mean, it's 10 years since we reorganised Scottish Enterprise and Business Gateway and all that stuff. A lot has happened in that 10 years, and I think what you're both saying is it's no longer fit for purpose. Well, as I said before, I totally, totally agree with, with you. And if you look at, um, you know, that two billion investment 
first of all, we're only putting 12.5 million of that into the business gateway operation. And if the whole small and micro sector is reliant on that as the, as the major, as the, the, the main source of, of support, that is proportionately not really enough in order to spot the future Tom Farmers and to support them in, in the right way. We have to make it more flexible. We have to be more responsive. It needs to be decentralised as well, because, of course, now that Business Gate was delivered through COSLA, it, it, it's come within that context of local authority pressure. So the local authorities, rightly or wrongly, are now looking at their budget restraint. They're potentially, I think they're spending less on Business Gateway than they perhaps were two or three years ago. So that whole area that's so critical for our economy is actually being pinched because it's possibly not in the right, right place. We've also centralised the Scottish Enterprise and High operations of, you know, since the local enterprise companies went. Now, there's all sorts of good reasons pro possibly why that happened. But I think actually the PSYBT model is a really good one to look at because... Which the, the good enterprise trusts mm -hmm. in the days were much more local and were much more dynamic in my view. Just going I, I to ran one of them as well. <laughs> well. I was just going to say, 20 years ago, when I started my own first business in the 80s, it was the local enterprise trust that supported me. And they were local people, local businesses, business people who wanted to help new businesses. Um, and there was an independence and a flexibility there that we just don't have now. Everything's been bureaucratised. I mean, we've got a business advisor in our, in our area who's a perfectly nice guy, but he's never been out of the public sector. Mm. And that's not uncommon within that context because a lot of the economic development personnel and local authorities have transferred into the business gateway. So we're really, you know, we, we just, we, I think we just have to relook at it all. And as I say, there are models now, um, there's, there's some good stuff. Um, that's, that's captured, and this, this is a rural review from the, the European Network of Rural Development that looks at, you know, what was tradition, what did traditional business support look like, and what does smart business support yes. look like, and it is about taking a, taking it away from that one-to-one -one transactional, very kind of top-down approach, and making it much more getting businesses involved in delivering alongside professional um, advisors, facilitators, and just loosening it all up yeah. and making it more possible. And presumably in that, I mean, I think one of the, 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 the uh, drawbacks of the existing system is that we've got a national system that's applied right across the country, irrespective of whether it's the right solution for that. You say rural areas, for example, are entirely different from urban areas. Um, so we, we need a much more diffuse type of approach to, to allow flowers to grow and so on? Mm. Um, well, Grobis came about because a group of local people in eastern Perthshire decided that they needed a, a support system that suited that area. Yeah. And, um, and we've always listened to what our business or clients are looking for rather than say, this is what you're getting, and it works. Um, and you know we've, we've had a lot of interest from other areas, so we may start to get a little bit more traction around that, but that needs needs supported as well. But I was just going to say that the new South of Scotland agency is surely a, a fantastic opportunity to try some of that out yes. and to, to take a different approach and not just to put a blueprint of the current SE or high models onto it and make it work like that. But I think there needs to be... Um, some activation, there needs to be some um, involvement from other bodies to make sure that doesn't happen, because that's the easy option, I think, going yeah. forward. Can I ask, Jim, just coming back to National Investment Bank, I totally agree with everything you said, because uh, I've seen it operate in other countries and it's very successful. Obviously, Bernie Higgins is, I think, in the last rows of preparing his report to the Scottish Government about how we set up the National Investment Bank. Can I ask if you've given him your thoughts on this matter, because it seems to be important that you do. Well, I, I, as I said, I had a paper, before Benny was um, appointed, I had a, a paper that I had commissioned by University College London yeah. um, by Mariana Matsukuto, who's on the Council for Economic Advisors. And I've been lobbying for this for a while because of my experience in other countries, and I'm glad to see that it's being done. Um, I haven't spoken to Benny directly about it, but I did, uh, he has got a copy of the report and I was supposed to be seeing him on Thursday. Um, 
but he's been called to another meeting. So, I mean, I'm very aware that we're nearly at the end of February right. and I worry about what might come out. But um, hopefully it'll be, I mean, it's got to be a positive move. Yeah. But I think it is a great opportunity to relook at a number of the support Absolutely. that we have for business. And I know there'll be pushback on, well, we don't want to make it too complicated to start with and lump everything in. But there really needs to be some sort of vision on where it's going to go to. Yeah. Because there's no use just plugging something else into the mix and confusing people about the, the roles of the different entities. I think you need to do it. And I, and I think it would be good from the national government, from Westminster, to try and get some responsibility for export finance because small and medium-sized companies need a more flexible support in export finance and it'd be better handled. It'd be better as a devolved yep. responsibility than handled from London. Um, so, you, you know, I would encourage that being part of the National Investment yeah. Bank um, because it's not working what's happening just now right. for, for SMEs. Can I just ask Thank if, you. The, Sorry. if your report is public or is it, is it possible for us to get a copy of your, re your I'm, report? I'm happy to, to send you a copy, yes. <laughs> yes, could I add, if there's any issues that are raised, then we would invite witnesses to send in, in writing any further thoughts they have on any of the issues and points made here. Now, I'd like to come to a short follow-up from Dean Lockhart and then move to a question from Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much. I think Alex has covered some of the issues I was going to address, but a uh, quick follow-up. Uh, we do spend two, two and a half billion pounds each year on enterprise skills development in Scotland, but we don't see the return in terms of business growth or, or, or economic growth. Um, with the, SM, the SNIB, the Scottish National Investment Bank coming on stream, that, that hopefully will make a difference. Is there a risk that we have a cluttered landscape in Scotland in terms of all the different agencies, Scottish Enterprise, HI, the New South of Scotland Agency, Business Gateway, the, the various agencies involved in economic development. That was one of the key conclusions from the Audit Scotland. Is that a risk in terms of the accessibility of enterprise help for small business? I think um, <coughs> Sandy to, to can start, to start us off on it awesome. is that it's not just, maybe taking a step back, is when we look at the healthcare system, and the public sector, then a decision is made by the state that actually all the professionals exist either within the NHS or within a small group outside of that. When we look at the um, education, something is similar to that is, is put forward. But in the business support area, there's actually, it's the other way around, is that the vast majority of people who can help um, young businesses, established businesses grow are other business people. And therefore, that should be get, they, those businesses should have access to those sorts of people. And peer groups in particular um, are, are very powerful. Scott, uh, Scale Up Institute uh, em emphasizes that peer networks are one of the most powerful, or the most powerful way to transfer learning and expertise in that way. So the question I would ask back again is, is it right that there's almost like a nationalised public support system and we shouldn't necessarily be looking to the public sector to deliver it? The public sector's role, and this has been highlighted in work by actually by a professor based here, although he had to go to Canada to do a lot of his research, uh, Professor Ben Spiegel, is, is the state's role to nurture the so-called ecosystem rather than to be the key point of delivery every single time. Now, that's not to say that the public sector doesn't have a role to play, but it's a role to play in partnership with others. And to answer your, your point there, Dean, about clutter, that would help reduce clutter because there's a lot of people shouting to be heard, whereas we, and I, I very much count ourselves as part of that and work very closely uh, both with Jim and Women's Enterprise Scotland as well, is that we have to work out that the hero of the story is the person trying to grow their business. It's not us. And we need to get back and work out how we collaborate to deliver for them and not be the ones either shouting for money or do this or do that and causing the confusion. I, I think you're absolutely right. It is too cluttered and it needs to be um, focused down a bit. But it, it always seems to be difficult to take things away from people. And, and I think you have to be um, quite assertive in that and you know give the vision for where the new investment bank is going and saying we want to put that under the, the bank. It would be managed by professionals, This I, I take it. that 
Um, Because you don't want it managed by civil servants, uh, you know, to be blunt. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Perhaps we can come to Jackie Bailey and then others may want to come in on these points. Thank you, Convener. I'm sure we'll return to the National Investment Bank in a a moment. Um, But I want to explore exports with people. Um, not least because you know we are a net importer of goods and services, we operate an annual trade deficit, um, and this week from the Export Statistics Scotland series, um, we find out from 2016 that there's been quite a substantial drop in exports uh, across Scotland, particularly to our largest market, which is the rest of the UK, um, a drop of something like 11.6%. Um, so I'm curious to know what you think we can do to boost the number of, of firms in Scotland exporting goods and services overseas, or indeed to the rest of the UK. Jackie Brayton. I just wanted to make a point generally that I don't think we actually measure um, the correct level of exports because, again, we're kind of out of date of the way people export because I look around at small businesses we deal with and a lot of them are exporting, but they're doing it through e-commerce, sending goods off to customers all over the world individually, and these are not being tracked anywhere So they won't show up in any statistics, particularly if they're they're small businesses. And I think that is one way, um, looking at the statistics of how many businesses in in Scotland are generating sales generally, not exporting, but generating sales via e-commerce, it's only 30%. So we've got huge potential to build on that, going back to the new... um, uh, broadband uh, availability that's going to to come Um, and off that if you could increase exporting through that I think it would make it more normal for businesses to think of um, selling their goods and services outside Scotland Well I think well certainly on on medium sized businesses it's definitely the the support that you need that may be delivered through some sort of export finance and even competing with European countries. And I'll, I'll give you an example of something. It was a, it was, um, a medium-sized company, I would say, a pump company that I, I bought in, in 2007. Now, we bid to uh, put the equipment in that when they were holding the Olympics in London, um, they were renewing the sewer, the sewer system and, and so on. for the. Uh, they hadn't been replaced since Victorian times. And Weir Pumps in Glasgow was the company that had supplied the original equipment. So we bid to um, for that contract and were very close in, in price. But it was awarded to a German company. And it was awarded because the German company had more financial support again from the KFW, the National Bank. And um, can you imagine um, Olympic Games being held in in Frankfurt and the Germans giving a contract for the infrastructure to a British company? Um, would, but it was, it, again, it was down to the support, the, the, the support mechanism in place to fund the working capital and maybe put up guarantees because there were guarantees required and perhaps I could just say something in guarantees because that's a big part of exporting. Up until the banking crisis, banks all provided you with bank bonds or guarantees because it was a contingent obligation. It wasn't money they had to give you and they would charge you 3% for, for it. It was easy money for them. After the banking crisis... and and. You know, the export credit sort of system had fallen away because the banks had stepped in to get this easy money. Um, After the the banking collapse and with um, the new regulations that went in, bonds, even although they were contingent obligations, had to be counted as core debt. So the banks all of a sudden weren't supplying these bank bonds to make it easy for companies to take on contracts or even support guarantees, even national guarantee, you know, for somewhere else in the UK. So that whole infrastructure disappeared and really there's nothing come in to replace 
the flexibility that was there with it. We do have export finance theoretically, but it doesn't work for small and me And when I say export finance, it's more into the guarantees that have to be in place to deliver the, the goods or the services that you're going to deliver. At one point, you asked about Frankfurt and German games. I mean, the German Bundestag was designed, the, the rebuilding of it, by a British architect. So, you know, I think the Germans... I'm sure you can come up with examples like that, but I'm talking about the mass of business. that You, you look at the German industrial sector. I mean, it doesn't even compare. It, it, it goes along and it, it's gone down slowly as a percentage of their GDP. You look at the UK and Scotland, it's, it's just collapsing. And, and it's going to continue going that way if we don't do something about it. And, and I think what you're describing is perhaps the opportunity lost, not just for the company, but subcontractors, that whole supply chain and jobs um, yep. staying local. So, so I am with you on that. Um, I want to tease out the National Investment Bank because you know, it's been announced several times. We're now going to see it because they finally got the, the capital that will enable them to, to bring this into reality through financial transaction money. Um, they're talking about taking all your points about you know, flexibility off the balance sheet, being creative, so it gets round EU procurement rules and state aid rules. Um, it, they're looking at £340 million. Is that enough, or do you think we're in danger of undercapitalizing this? No, it's, it's, it's not enough by a long shot. Um, and if, if I, you know, if I give you an example of a, a bid that we could have put in for Irish ferries, for the shipyard, 315 million was the the value of the contract. It had to be done by 2020. We would have had to take our workforce in Port Glasgow up from 360 to about a thousand. Um, we couldn't bid for it because the terms were you get 20% progress payments and 80% on delivery of the ships. KFW backed Flensburg in Germany to take that contract. We can't take it. Now, an 80% guarantee in that's 250 million. So are the Scottish government going to give me, tie up 250 million uh, out of that investment bank for one contract? No way. Um, and when I compare it with, um, when I compare it again with Finland, because I've got personal experience of that, that's why I've mentioned it a few times, um, last year their support in uh, guarantees and bridging finance and, and capital for startups and growth was 2 billion euros in a year. That's a country of 5.5 million people, same size as Scotland. So it needs to be up at that sort of level. Not, at, But I understand it's going to be a billion to a billion and a half. And really, to, I think there's, I think there may be some question as to whether you need EU approval. And I think in the people who are looking at its mind, there is no question in my mind that you want to get European approval for this. Because other, if you don't, they're going to hold it up as state aid. You've got to get it round the European the European rules for um, for being able to support businesses, and and I'm I'm sure that's not. But I'm not sure that's happening. Um, so, so you would envisage it probably as almost a two-tier operation, one where um, they're, they're providing guarantees and indeed loans to very significant projects, as well as able to perhaps engage with SMEs on export finance. Is, yes. is that okay? And that, can okay. I just say that a, a key part of it is being able to raise outside fin raise a bond for the bank outside of your national debt. Yeah. Um, that's a key part, and that's what that's what qualifies it as being able to get round state aid because it's independently financed and it's a commercial entity. Although it's government owned, it works under commercial rules mm -hmm. with outside money, and that's that's the two boxes you've got to take to be to be able to convince Europe that this isn't state aid, and then you can point the finger 
to all the other national banks that are set up the same way. If you don't do it that way, they'll come back and say, well, they're different. They do it a different way. You can't do this, and you're going to be blocked. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, can I ask about, the, the again, back to the institutional cluster, which I think is a theme here. Um, is it clear which of our institutions, um, public institutions, support exporting, and are they doing a decent enough job? The uh, only institution that I know that supports exports is UK Export Finance. Okay. And it doesn't work for SMEs because it has to go through the major banks. Then, although they will say to the government officials in Westminster, yes, we're doing this, we're very supportive, uh, they ask smaller companies for additional security. And very often these companies don't have the security to give up because they're already fully secured el elsewhere. Yeah. I was thinking of Scottish Development International, SE, any experience? It's, the... it's not, it's not it's support not... for the bonds. Okay. You know, it's, it's other types of okay. support, which is also important. Other types of support. Um, we've also got, I, I think the name's changed, but UKTI as well is obviously an important um, access point for, for firms. And I think, you know, you, there'll be some examples of people who've had excellent support and very fast and very clear. And there'll be other examples where they've got lost for, for potentially 12 months and got no advice. And in a growing business and in a business that's looking to export, 12 months of going, going to the wrong doors is can be fatal, certainly to those export um, ambitions. I, I think they do uh, give good support. It's the next step when you have to get the contract okay. and fund it and put up the guarantee, yeah. because um, we've used them to very good effect mm -hmm. on introductions, even using office space uh, that they've had to help, and, and I've found the support excellent. So I, I think that part is actually quite good, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't do away with it, but it's the... It's all the kind of financial support that we've got in different forums that I think needs to be um, more efficiently organised. And Suzanne Lawson wanted to come yeah, in as well. I do think we have, have an issue of clutter, and, and the, the businesses I speak to, many of them are, are now quite early stage, they don't know where to go. Uh, and, and I think the big problem is to access um, UKTI or, or um, SDI assistance, you have to go through Business Gateway and through Scottish Enterprise. And I think the issue there is a, uh, one of language. If you don't say, I'm, I'm a high growth potential business and I want to internationalize and I'm a technology-based firm and using all of the, the different sort of language identifiers, firms don't make it through the, through the front door. And so I think we're seeing a, a huge problem here in terms of access to even that, that early stage, um, more generalist support before they even get um, f further through their, their own export journey. And, and I think the, the clutter is, is a bit of an issue in how we can actually signpost individuals and organizations to relevant sources of support, I think is a big discussion to be had. And it links back into this issue of, of, of renegotiating or, or, or reorganizing the support landscape in Scotland. Um, like, like Jim, I, I think all the organizations have, have a role, and, and I don't think we should be doing away with anyone or anything. But I do think there's got to be a way that for the lay person, for our students, for our young people, for, you know, individuals who are starting a business without a, a, an existing network, how do we make sure they can access the right types of support in a timely manner so that they don't sit around waiting for 12 months? And, I, and I'm unconvinced that that currently is the case. I think we have a lot of people who are turned away or, or who spend ages and ages looking for support uh, and, and actually can't find and access it effectively. Thank you. And now moving on to Gillian Martin and then Colin Beattie after that. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I am interested in what, I mean, government can only do so much when it comes to businesses, and the Scottish government's already done a few things, like the Scottish Business Pledge, for example, which is voluntary. Um, the UK government done the gender pay gap reporting, which doesn't have an action plan associated with it. There's, you know, people can have an action plan, it's again voluntary, but they're not asking for one. And you're talking about business support, and business support maybe comes from um, agencies like Scottish Enterprise, Business Gateway, or if we have a Scottish Investment Bank which is actually giving out finance to companies, do you think that should be dependent on companies making promises to deliver fair work? Because you're right, a few of you have said that sustainable, a sustainable economy comes out of having good jobs, having fair work, having opportunities, having people actually satisfied in the work that you're doing. 
Do you see that there's any movement there? And, and, and that's the way to encourage people to deliver fair work? Well, I, I think there is, but you're in danger of then looking at companies that may maybe can't provide high wages. You know, you've got to create high a higher wage companies, um, but not not um, damage or kill the ones that can only afford to pay lower wages. Because there's a role for that. If it's an entry, if it gets someone into work and it keeps them busy and it gives them a platform to move on, then um, you know. Do you go with the living wage or the minimum wage or whatever? You know, there's a there's a lot of low-paying jobs about in Scotland. They're not bad people, and they're providing a, a good um, opportunity for some young people, maybe some older people as well. But um, I do think that, uh, on the whole, in general, in companies, you should be, you know, they should be seen to be paying. Uh, Good wages uh, have equality, um, and and all these other things that we're asking about. And you know, on on the um, on the pledge, this came up uh, the business pledge. Uh, this came up recently. A meeting I was at, and and I think there was some complaint that only is it five thousand people have signed up the business pledge out of you know a whole load more companies, um, not. That doesn't mean that they're not doing what the business pledge is asking them to do. Not everybody wants to go out and wave their hands and say, I've signed up to the business pledge. I think there's a lot of businesses do it that are not signed up to the business pledge. And I wasn't signed up to the business pledge, but I do all and more of what the business pledge is asking you to do. So I was approached after saying this to sign up to, which I have done. <laughs> um, in, in a number of companies we have, but we we hadn't bothered doing it because we're we're just doing what we think is fair and the right thing to do, and it fits with all of those. So it's dangerous just to look at the people who are signed up and say it's not working, because I, I I don't think that's the case. I think it is. the The whole undertone is that the majority of businesses are looking to do what's in that pledge. How can you encourage the businesses that are not doing the things? that promote fair work into doing it by making the business case for it. For example, we had a big inquiry in the gender pay gap and we had some great big organisations come in here and saying how they were trying to eradicate the gender pay gap, but not many of them were actually be able to articulate what the business case was for that, and I'm convinced there is one. It's very easy to, to mm -hmm. solve the gender, you know, that gap, just be fair about it and mm -hmm. pay the same. We had a discussion at one of our meetings yesterday all the females in our business same that earn the same as some more than their equivalent male. You know, mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. But that's see equal pay. Uh -huh. That's not. But the gender pay gap necessarily. There's a lot more to that. What do you mean by the gender pay gap? The then? gender pay gap is about women's progression within a company, for example, over a period of time, given putting uh, in, uh, things in place in the company that allows maybe people with caring responsibilities yep. to be uh -huh. promoted in a way that's fair with the people that don't have caring responsibilities. There's a lot more to that. Flexible working, for example. But a lot of these companies that were doing it, they were doing it because it was the right thing to do, but weren't able to articulate that there was actually a very strong business case for doing it, which I think might encourage other businesses who are maybe not doing these fair work practices to actually get on board with it. So I think it's back to this productivity argument that I gave you. You know, if, if people are... are are, are happy, they've got security, and there's fair pay and fair, you know, fair treatment. Um, that has, you know, maybe you should be emphasising the productivity improvements that can come through from mm -hmm. that. It pays off big for companies. You know, you get you get much better return if you do that than than if you don't do it. And maybe that's where the emphasis should be instead of on R D spend. You know. Do more of this and you'll get your productivity up. Jackie. An aspect of one of your point, I think, Gillian, is if you look back at the vast majority of people who are running their own their one one person businesses or self employed, often it takes them a while to get up to what you'd regard as a, a as a fair wage or a, a living living wage so many many self employed people rely on the benefit system to get to that stage and 
we actually have quite an appalling approach to self-employment with, with the benefit system. We've got something called the new enterprise allowance, which is almost unworkable for most people, and it's not actually terribly valuable. <clears throat> it's actually paying less than the enterprise allowance did 20 years ago. I think it's £33 a week. Um, and we've got evidence now that the rolling out of universal credit system is actually going to have a, a bigger effect, bigger negative effect on self-employed people than any other groups. So I think we've got quite a major issue. Again, it's going back to how do we get people into, into that whole process of building up what they're trying to do and get their, um, achieve their aspirations when actually there's quite a lot stacked against them at that stage. <laughs> And on the, on the gender gap, I was really shocked to read. I've got some stats here. They're not published yet. It's a working paper, but this is on rural stats. Women living in remote rural Scotland have the lowest annual income of any group and the largest median gender pay gap at £5,076. And that is, is really appalling um, and very difficult to deal with when you're operating in a rural um, economy where there are fewer opportunities um, and something that we all need to be, be more aware of, I think. I wanted to come in. Really just to echo the points I said already, I think we've got to recognise and appreciate that it's a long-run societal issue that we're addressing here and that that doesn't mean we don't have to put our shoulders to the wheel to solve it, and we certainly do. I think looking to, to Jim's point about many businesses, the, the, the businesses I spend most of my time with um, they do trying to develop those sorts of cultures um, to do that. and But equally, they, they struggle sometimes when they're being told what to do by somebody very far away. So, so maybe that's one of the reasons they don't sign up to things like pledges or react against it. Um, it's only because it's a long run issue and because it's complex, then you know there's going to be multi areas we have to, to address it. One particular area is about role models. And there's you know both on the sort of emotional appeal of... There's people like Jim and others who are doing it, and they're doing it because it's good business sense, then getting that out into the media and, and then building a culture that that's the right thing to do. On the other side of things is the hard data as well, where we can produce hard data of evidence why this is better. Um, and the last part of that is, again, we work closely with a lot of the next generation coming through. They've got a very different value set than previous generations, and their the idea of things like profit with purpose, et cetera, is coming through there. So I think that if we can give it some nudges along the way, for me, that's better than big grandstand, you're a bad person because you haven't signed this bit of paper, um, then I'd be cautious about, about that. You, know, you mentioned the nudges, and I, I guess that comes back to my earlier sort of point, is that the nudges could be incentivising things and uh, is there a role for government there or is that really going to rest with things like the business support or working with other businesses and whether you invest in another business if they've got fair work or if they've got a lower gender pay gap you think that's where they're going to come or is it just going to be about things that get nothing to do with government and about the business community actually standing up and, and championing these things so, I mean, again, I'm sure we could spend a whole session talking about this. Some of the ex taking two extremes. One would be looking at the um, or how to support and, you know, the nudge theory, how to support the more general mass media uh, presentation of, of organisations that are, are developing uh, these kinds of, um, of work practices and, and their results. So there's how you use that. The other side of it, again, with the National Bank, is it could be that part of when they look at you know the support they get, that well, what practices are they conducting? Now, the types of businesses Jim's got, they'll be doing it. It's not, it shouldn't be whether they sign the pledge or not. It's actually what's happening on the ground. Um, that's a much you know, clearer way of doing it as well. So I would look at every single opportunity of influence there is and then keep that moving forward. But do it because it's good business. But, the, but I think you've got to, you can't be rigid and make rules because if you take the example that Jackie gave, say a couple of people wanted to join a business, in a rural business, and they were happy to take 5,000, but there was some system to top them up. There was, you, you couldn't say to that business, you have to pay them this amount of money because it just wouldn't happen. You know, you've got to look at the, 
the particular circumstances of the business and where it is that you're looking at. So, you know, to make hard and fast rules about if we're going to give you this support, then you've got to do this, this and this, then you're going to, you're not going to be able to help support companies that you really need to be supporting. Just one other little, little point, just to, um, about rural. Uh, I'm very interested in your experience in Finland. Um, I'm going there in about six weeks. And I'm interested, do, does the Finnish economic activity have a, uh, an equal, well, obviously not an equal, but a good rural spread? Or is it all concentrated in the big cities? No, no, it, it's actually quite rural. I mean, we're halfway between Helsinki and Lapland. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's all, I mean, if you if you look at Finland, it's all kind of trees and, yes. and lakes and there's communities all over the place. So, yeah, so it can it's, be done. It's, it's, it can be done, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'd like to move on now to Colin Beatty. Um. Thank you, Vener. Um, I'd like to ask uh, two questions kind of around the same subject. The Scottish Fiscal Commission um, has commented that, or believes, that weak growth in Scotland has become structural rather than cyclical since the uh, Depression, or at least since the, since the, uh, since the recession. So I'd like to ask, do you agree with that? And why has it happened? And secondly, do you share the view of the Scottish Fiscal uh, Commission that Scotland, like other advanced countries, is entering a period of long-term poor economic growth or productivity, productivity growth? Well, first, I, I agree with what they, they say, but I don't think we necessarily are... are um, entering a period of long, uh, long economic decline or low growth, um, I think we are. If we don't do anything, if we, if we keep doing things the same way we're doing them, but I believe, uh, I strongly believe that you need to set the vision and the goal of what you want to do, and then work out what you need to do to get there. And to get to higher growth is absolutely possible, but we need to be doing the right things. The explanation for it. Um, you know, probably sound like a broken record, but the banking crisis at 2007, 2008, uh, you can't underestimate the support that took away from businesses. They, you know, I know uh, Peter Cummins and the others got really slated for some of the the big um, challenges uh, that they created in the bank, but underlying that was a lot of support for smaller Scottish companies, more support than, um, you know, you would think a big bank like that uh, would give. It was because they were Scottish, they were based in Scotland, and they had a bias towards supporting smaller Scottish companies. We don't have a Scottish bank anymore. You know, Royal Bank of Scotland, I've got to go to London to speak to anyone senior. Um, and Bank of Scotland's now Lloyd's. We, you know, we... Those those companies went the extra mile to support small businesses, and that's gone. That's gone now, and nothing has really stepped in to to support it. And that's why, in, unless we do something to fill that gap, then we are going to see a continuing low growth scenario in Scotland. But what is going to change that? I think the National Investment Bank. We are setting up a debt fund and uh, a new Scottish bank and it's to try and fill that gap and, and get more support into small companies. We, we need people doing more of this to get the support in. And I think from the, the government's point of view, all of the kind of support mechanisms we have, we talked about the clutter, we need to you know sharpen that up a bit and, and get more efficient support in through to the companies. I think if we do all of that, then that's what's going to change. But we need to we need to change it. It's not going to change if we don't aggressively go after it and change it. Would it do you agree with that Scotland is the same as other advanced economies in this regard? Or are other economies actually performing better than we are and already have some solutions? The Fiscal Commission seems to think we are the same as other advanced economies in respect to this uh, this uh, this poor growth. That's, that's, that's the 
that's because we're of the the environment we've got around us, the the, the infrastructure. Of course, they they they're they're talking about um, if things don't change. That's the only way they they can only comment on the the environment we're we're in just now. And unless that changes, um, you know, I think we are the same as others. The others the others uh, are changing. You know, the others are changing. So they they possibly will pull ahead of us, and we'll be we'll be further behind. I think Sandy Kennedy and Jackie Burton wanted to come in on this as well. So Sandy and then Jackie. So just to, to echo um, Jim's point is that um, when, we, when and maybe it's a question back to Jim partly as well, is that when we talk about the Bank of Scotland and RBS support pre-2008, it's not just in terms of hard cash, because too often we talk about the, the financial challenges just being about the availability of finance, and that's particularly an export, that is clearly an issue. Um, however, it was the advice, it was the connectivity, it was the inspiration, it was the um, raw experience that, that, that the banks had in them at that time that provided additional support and then what it unlocked elsewhere. So what we've got to be careful of is it's not just the finance, it's also the, the support that sits around them as well, and that's been replaced in part by the public sector. Our argument is it should be all of us are in it together, but in a much more joined up fashion. And the second point, which is to your point about, you know, where do we go? Well, obviously they're looking at it from a long run um, and comparing yourself against the uh, other um, advanced economies. In, in many ways, I would argue that if there was a second industrial revolution where we were very strong, we missed out on the third and we've been getting ourselves sorted out through the third industrial, as we enter the fourth industrial revolution, we have an opportunity to say, well, what kind of country do we want to be and how are we going to front up without a lot of some of the legacy issues that, that others have as well? And just quoting from the World Economic Forum, they recognise that it's people who are going to drive it and that interaction with um, AI in their case particularly, but people with grit, creativity and entrepreneurial spirit now, Scotland's got a long heritage over centuries of people like that, and we need to re-embrace that. And if we can, along with the structural stuff we're talking about, then, yeah, we can buck that trend into this next stage. Yeah, I was actually going to say it's, this is about people, and we undoubtedly have the people in Scotland that can change that, long, that, that forecast and strengthen the, the performance going forward. And... You know, two key areas I would highlight that have already been discussed this morning. Gender. We're looking at a gender gap in Scotland where only 20% of our businesses are owned and driven by women. And we know that there are women out there who want to be part of that business culture, but for all sorts of reasons, some of which we've touched on, they're not making it even to the first step. So we have to reimagine our economy and our infrastructure and how we deal with that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's frustrating that we have a lot of commitment, we have a lot of policy commitment from the Scottish Government towards making women's enterprise central to economic growth. Um, and there's a, there's a policy framework and we have a lot of activity around that. But the entire budget given to women's enterprise activity in this past financial year was £400,000. Um, it's, it's, it's a mere drop in the ocean compared to what we actually need in order to make a substantial difference. So instead of saying, yes, it's a good thing and we should be getting more women, we actually really need to tackle it head on and say that is potentially a way of making up the difference in our economies. There's a £7.6 billion prize if the same number of women as men were starting businesses in Scotland. And as has been pointed out, more than once that equates to the projected deficit that Brexit may cause to our economy over the next few years. So there's a real prize worth going for there. And on the rural economy, um, rural G GVA growth has actually been quite strong. If you separate it out from the urban economy, it's been positive um, since 1997, whereas up till then it was actually uh, slightly going back. But interestingly, the worst performing sector sectors in the rural economy are agricultural fisheries and forestry and yet those are the ones that get all the investment and the attention now obviously that is going to there's huge changes coming about there but what we've got is a, a revolution within the rural economy where new people are moving in new people with high levels of skills with aspirations with with entrepreneurial ideas 
and with the, with the improved infrastructure that we've now got in rural areas, it could become a major part of the, the economic powerhouse that perhaps people haven't thought of it as, as before. Sorry, perhaps very briefly, and then uh, we'll just, move just, on to just, a, just a quick question, just to clarify one particular point. The Scottish Fiscal Commission uh, has <laughs> put forward that it's not just Scotland that potentially is entering a long-term low productivity growth, but that the other advanced economies are as well. Would you agree with that? I would I would agree with it uh, across the board on on other developed economies. Um, you know I think uh, there are big changes coming about in in the way we all work. Um, you know one of the things that Scotland's very I think got, got a lot of expertise expertise in is data analytics and big data in the in the universities. We haven't found a way to to translate that into big companies and and growing companies. But um, there are other countries who are looking and investing in those things with patient capital. I know it. You know, it, it's not just th this. This covers just so many e areas, so many problems that we've got. And just going back to um, uh, the, the comment that uh, Sandy made about it's not just about the money. It's not the big. Another big difference with the banks is that it's moved from relationship managers who understand the local businesses to algorithms on a computer that decides whether you get a loan or not. And that's all gone with the, the bigger banks. And a relationship managers now get embarrassed uh, if their clients don't, don't get a loan. In fact, they don't even promise it anymore or, or are, are really pushing it because it goes into a machine and we've lost that. And we need to recreate the, the personal understanding of the business and the people uh, that are running the business and the communities that are involved in it. Um, that's a big, a big gap now in the way we've moved. Uh, other other uh, developed economies have more local banks. Like if you look at Germany, they've got a lot of state banks that do support the local communities that make decisions based on, you know, relationships and, and what they want to do. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't be... And another thing to remember about the, the Fiscal Commission, uh, this is the first time they've had to predict what the growth is going to be, and they're not going to overdo it. Uh, you know, they would rather be surprised on the upside than uh, be caught out in the downside. Right. And Susan Rice is a very careful lady, you know, so she wouldn't want to be uh, sticking her neck out too, too far. Right, we'll, on that point, move on to Kezia Dugdale's question. Thanks, convener. I wanted to take us back to um, the role of government in supporting the growth of Scotland's economy. And I've heard everything you've said about, about banking and how important that is and how important the National Investment Bank will be, how important it is to address uh, export finance. I don't in any sense want to belittle that. I've, I've heard it. It's noted. But I wanted to ask you more specifically about um, the comments you made earlier about how to support decent employment, high quality companies with decent jobs in Scotland. Aside from banking, what is it that the Scottish Government could do, um, either by getting out of the way or with a direct interventionist approach, to do more to create good, decent, sustainable jobs in Scotland? Well, I, I, I know you're saying you've heard about the bank and that's like there's something else. You know, the, the public sector is responsible for a lot of the big companies that are about. You know, if you look in America, a lot of the big tech companies come out of government support for defence contracts or space, the space programme, and a lot of money's going into that. And then, you know, a lot of money's going in to support the companies that spin out of it. Uh, companies can't just do this on their own. It needs to be a partnership, I think. And I, I just think this is a... I don't think there's there's anything more important than, than getting this whole issue about the kind of financial support that you give. Because, you know... There's a lot of talented business people about and they know in general what they need to do. They just need the help to do it. Just again, I suppose it's the it's the it's the it's the finance and the support side. And just quoting uh, from a recent paper by Professor Spiegel and Harrison, 
they say that the proper role of the state is to cultivate the entrepreneurial community and culture that will eventually help to produce and reproduce the resources rather than trying to create them from scratch. So translating that out is the government, you know, definitely doing the things that Jim's talking about, but can also do more to nurture that or a cluttered ecosystem as it is at the moment, but nurture it rather than feel actually could everybody get out of the way we're going to do it. I think the key thing is about how to nurture that entrepreneurial ecosystem. It's a key part in conjunction with making sure that the finance is getting to the right people and the export support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, if, it, if, if we accept that, the one thing we could really do is the banking and then not look for any other policies to address. Maybe I'll ask a question about the National Investment Bank instead, because I think there is an acceptance, there is a good idea, and that's universal across all the political parties. It's universally agreed um, you know, from business leaders. I'm not sure whether the rhetoric matches up. So some people think a national investment bank should exist to fund capital infrastructure projects that will um, benefit the public sector, whether that's transport links, um, you know, big builds like new bridges, etc. Whereas what we're hearing from you today, Jim, is actually what we need is a, is a national investment bank that's prepared because of the security of its finance to be slightly riskier uh, and do the, the providing of the finance that our high street banks won't do just now because of um, the issues that they face. So is there a agreed acceptance about what a national investment bank should do from those people who are going to set it up? Or, or is there a lot of confusion about its ultimate purpose? No, I, I don't. I, there are plenty of models out there. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, all you need to do is go and look at how other countries do it. The French really uh, recently did, I think it was in 2014, did um, uh, what we were talking about, Alex, there in, in taking a number of their entities that support business and put them together working in what they call BPI, uh, bonk poor industry, you know, so it's, uh, um, they, so they've, they've, they've put it all into that. But I think it can help, if you take um, housing, affordable housing, low cost housing, the companies that are not getting the support just now to be able to do that are the small builders. You know, I've talked to, in fact, one of the people who's going to support the the startup of this new bank, or going to invest in it, is a large building company. But he said that someone who's going to build 10 or 20 houses, they're not going to get the funding. They're not going to get the support. And, you know, you could you could really start, really encourage the, the building of affordable housing and get that going by supporting the small businesses that could do that, that are not getting the support just now. And, you know, it's, it's big ones that are not interested in something like that. They want to build 200 or 400. I think the the business that I'm talking to about supporting the bank, they're building 400 houses in Perth or something. But they wouldn't look at, you know, a, a, a development of uh, affordable housing in, you know, in, in a smaller scale. But if you get lots of people doing that, you're going to address the affordable housing issue as well. Just by being an enabler of small businesses that, that can then employ more people, you know, uh, it, 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 it all becomes, um, you know, a, build, a building block to a stronger economy. Uh, just on the bank, um, one, one issue I think is quite important at this critical stage of its development is that the consultation around the bank has not been particularly widespread. So I don't know any businesses that we deal with even know that it's, it's coming about. We haven't been asked for any feedback on it. So in terms of the role of the bank, what markets it is going to serve, what size of businesses it's likely to support, there's a lot of non non-knowledge out there. So I think there's maybe an issue there around at least having a wider conversation about it and getting more input around how it could operate. Um, I mean, I have no idea whether it's even thinking about the very low end of the market because most businesses we talk to really struggle to get any any um, entity interested in lending them 10, 20,000 pounds, which is what a lot of very small businesses are looking for. And there's also hardly any grant support at that level either. So four or five years ago in our area, we could point to around four or five different sources of grants that small businesses could look at. And there's now none, apart from one small pilot that we're actually managing on behalf of SSE, 
hope we're imaginatively putting some wind farm funding into a grant scheme for small businesses. And it was launched last May, expected to last two years, and it's going to be fully expended by next month, which shows the demand for that kind of finance. One more question, convener. It's something that we haven't touched on yet. There was a report out yesterday from Cities Outlook projecting the impact of automation on Scotland's future employment. They're suggesting 230,000 jobs to go over the next 10 years. They suggest that it's going to hit, in particular, uh, places like Dundee with a strong uh, industrial heritage that may be struggling to grasp some of the new employment opportunities. Uh, I wondered if the panellists had any views on um, whether there's a greater role for government in anticipating some of the challenges that are going to come from automation and what that might look like? I just think that's um, scaremongering. I think uh, if you look at history, every time some new technology is coming out that's going to do away with jobs, new jobs appear, and that's what's going to happen. There will be other jobs, and what you need to be able to do is support the, the growth of these other jobs and the companies that emerge to, to create these other jobs. But, um, you know... You don't need to interfere in that. That that's gonna that's gonna work out okay. Believe me. <laughs> Come on now to Tom Arthur. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, we've touched on a, a number of areas um, which perhaps fall under the, the fair work agenda, which in itself more broadly comes under the uh, rubric of inclusive growth, which is of course one of the Scottish government one of the four pillars of the Scottish government's economic strategy. Can I invite the panel um, to each set out what their definition and understanding of inclusive growth is and speak to how they feel the relationship between inclusive growth and more conventional understandings of growth is? Um, you know, I've, I've got um, a pet... This is a, a kind of pet subject of mine because I think we've got an excluded group um, from, you know, the areas of multiple multiple deprivation that we have in some of our bigger cities like Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dundee. Uh, if I take Glasgow as an example, um, 700 uh, young people a year leave school um, at the statutory leaving age, 50% um, of, of, of whom will go into a job or go to college, so they're motivated. 30% um, will get involved with Skills Development Scotland or activity events. Schools are allowed to put a ticket that and say it's a positive destination. It's positive in that they're engaging with the support, but it's not positive destination. And, you know, the figures that we get um, kind of cover that up a bit. But there's 20% that disappear off the radar. They don't engage with any public support and that's the poverty trap and it happens every year and it's the same statistic in Edinburgh and the same statistic in Dundee, which are the two other cities that I've tested and it repeats consistently. That's a large number of young people that are being trapped in, a, in poverty and we don't do anything about it. We don't, we, we talk about it, inclusive growth for me is getting those, giving those young people who are talented, maybe don't fit into the academic system, but are talented, and we should be giving them the training and opportunities and the education that, that fits them, and we should be engaging them in a way that they will engage. And, um, you know, because of my frustration with this, I started Newlands Junior College, which has been hugely successful. 100% success in them going into work or going to college. 100% real jobs, real college places. And this is the fourth year. I've got a meeting this afternoon. I've got the education secretary uh, supporting, supporting it in some way. My real problem is the local authority. I've got another meeting with the lead, leader of Glasgow City Council this, this afternoon. Um, they're, they're letting these young people down. Now, we're working on, on starting one in Edinburgh. I've actually got a meeting with the Stirling University and, and, and asked me to get involved with Clark Manninshire, and we're looking at Dundee as well. This is happening every year, and it's been happening for a long time. 
and we don't address it. You know, we talk about attainment being getting five hires or more, a, a certain grade. Um, we need those young people in the skill base as te technicians. Um, and we're not investing in them. You know, I gave an example to the Council of Economic Advisors saying, you know, if you take um, we to Tommy from Tory Glen, a rough area of Glasgow, we invest four years of secondary education in him, 6,700 a year. Um, two of it's wasted because he stops attending after two years. He's absent. But... Um, Nigel from Newton Merns, posh part of Glasgow. We invest six years of secondary education in him and four years of university education. So Nigel gets more support than we Tommy. We Tommy's not worth the additional support. And it's not a big it's not a big additional amount of money. So inclusive growth to me is taking care of those people at the bottom, not to be trying to push more people through a system that only caters for people. It's the majority it caters for, and it caters for them in a good way, but you're leaving too many people behind, and that's not inclusive. And I think exactly what Jim said, there's, there's the enterprise parallel with all of that. We've already talked a little bit about that this morning, but a real um, inclusive growth economy is about helping anybody or enabling anyone who wants to create their own job, a business, whatever it is that they need to create an economic future for themselves to be able to do that. So it comes back to the kind of support that's available. And, and that's about looking outside the normal areas as well. We, we have a group of entrepreneurs in our area with health issues and they come together as a peer group regularly. They don't talk about their health issues. They talk about how they can support each other to build their businesses. And when you think that there's hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people with health issues across the country, sometimes you can't go into traditional employment. That's a prime example of where an inclusive growth approach would help uh, if there's the right support available for these people. But another, another look at it, another perspective is, uh, Jim touched on procurement. I think we're creating, we, we create uh, an elitist um, version of business in Scotland because we tend to concentrate most of the public sector procurement on a relatively small number of businesses. And we make it really difficult for very small businesses to get into that system. And various attempts have been made to, to address that over the years and haven't really succeeded. It needs a real effort. And, and ironically, perhaps post-Brexit, there might be more opportunities because often the excuses around fair tendering, etc., and European rules are used against opening up to smaller businesses. But to me, that would be a key way of ensuring that there's more equality of growth rather than exclusive growth. Again, echoing what's already been said on the panel, um, from for for us uh, in Entrepreneur Scotland, inclusive growth, if you look at it from an economy point of view, is that nobody's left behind, so Tommy's not left behind and, and other people like that within an organisation is the same, is that this is something that, and many of the best businesses do this, is that everybody is coming through together, so they benefit. Skyscanner would be a good example of that. Um, just a, a small additional point, which is that Inclusive growth for me also includes those people who have got high potential, and that could be women, that could be young people, and therefore making um, the top end as well. So the people who can be really successful and really maybe create the businesses of the future, uh, for them to have uh, the equal opportunity. So just as an example, our Salter Scholar Intern Programme, where we send them all over the world coming, and they do come from university, 40% of them come from a widening access background. So we've got to be careful that the superstars that are coming, who make it through some of the low progression schools, that we don't stunt their growth as well. So we have to do it for Tommy and we have to do it for his big brother who happens to have managed to get to university and is showing absolutely stellar potential to be the next Jim McCall. Don't wish that. All <laughs> <No>, right. <laughs> well, perhaps um, uh, I'm conscious of time. Perhaps a, a brief final question from Jamie Halcrow-Johnson. Um, 
I wanted to talk um, uh, about skills as well, so it's good that, and Jim, you've, you've, you've covered uh, some of that. I wanted to kind of uh, look basically at what the role of skills can play in terms of economic growth, particularly um, perhaps you know, continuing this, that skills training and retraining for the over 25s, which um, isn't an area that has perhaps been focused on enough except where there are specific issues f f within sectors. So it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Well, you know, I, I I think it is important, but um, the the core of the problem that creates the over twenty five, I think, starts way back at the the early years in the well, it's it's all back to our our areas of multiple deprivation, which is a you know a terrible leak to have that you, you have to you know we had to have that, but um, you know a lot of the early years work I think is really important. And the reason I started the, this, I called it a junior college so it didn't have the stigma of a special school, but it takes them at 14 because I think if you don't get them before they get out in the streets and get into bad stuff, they're already out in the streets then, but if you can give them an alternative, you've got a better chance of saving them. And I don't think enough support goes in at, at that point. We do, we, there's, a lot, there's a lot goes on, but it's maybe a six week course we're trying to deal with people that are coming from really troubled backgrounds that for years have been abused mentally, sometimes physically. They're coming from really disruptive homes. We pick, they're not healthy. Um, you know, we pick them up in the morning, we give them breakfast, we take them to uh, college. So we tie up with the local colleges on three half days a week to give them a choice of three vocational skills because they, you know, really get them interested in something. But the other um, the other pillar that we have is um, life skills. And I think the longer you wait to, to, to really embed these life skills which are missing from their earlier years, and that's, you know, we, we do um, uh, Duke of Edinburgh Award, we take them out to, out to uh, national parks, to museums, but we also teach them things like the f the first week in, um, or you know, a few weeks into the, when they join us. Um, this is eye contact week, and all week you've got to have eye contact with each other. Now it gets overdone, and they make a joke of it. But after eye contact week, they all speak to you by looking at you in the eye, and these are simple things. And then how to deal with their presentation when they're going for a job or they're filling in a form. Um, you know, it's it's life skills like that that many of us take for granted that scare the hell out of these young people. And I think the longer you go on, um, it's still important to have that. I don't want to, um, you know, to take away from that. But the longer they go on uh, with the old life skill model if, without you changing it, it, the more difficult and the more expensive it becomes to change it, I think. You would start, I mean, you're obviously catering for that at, at Newlands, but that should be starting a lot earlier. Yes, I mean, one, one jaw-dropping statistic we found out, we do a literacy test on the people we take in. 34% have a literacy age of between six and seven. How can you expect these young people to go out and engage with training or skills development when they've got a literacy age of between six and seven? So we develop a course that over six weeks can move them on a year every six weeks in the literacy age. Now, you only, you, you only want to get to 12. Um, you know, I've probably got a literacy age of about 10 or 11. 12 is kind of the peak. Um, so, you know, they're not miles away from it. They, they just need moved up quite a bit. Um, Any other panel members want to come in for some final comments, perhaps? Um, just quickly on skills, I, I think there's um, an issue around how do we con how do we provide lifelong skills development for business owners who can't afford to take time out of their business to go and do an accelerator course or an expensive business management course or something like that. And I think there's a huge opportunity to develop peer learning models 
um, with, with other businesses and to really help people see that continuing to learn wherever they are in their business journey is really important, particularly given the need for learning new technology skills and the opportunities that digital um, is going to bring. And just two quick examples. So Women's Enterprise Scotland are working with some business gateways to provide uh, leadership training for women business owners. They've just put on their third, I think it is, in Fife, and it's oversubscribed immediately, which shows the demand for that sort of thing. It's a relatively informal approach. It's women sharing with each other, um, but it doesn't happen often enough. And, and in Perthshire, we do around six, seven, eight learning sessions a month where businesses, eight or ten businesses, come together. Somebody who knows a wee bit more about one subject will present, and then everybody else chips in, and everybody ends up learning a lot more at the end of the night. And they've had a useful networking and development opportunity, and it's not it's not difficult to do. It's very easily facilitated. So it's sort of deformalising that skills, because we always see skills and training and development. It sounds like it's got to be a formal course. It doesn't have to be. And can I just add on the... Um on, on the college that we've got, we have uh, links with industry to support us with gov uh, local businesses. But a more important part is young people coming from these businesses in to talk to the young people and also the young people going out and spending time with the businesses. And, um, you know, just to make it clear, I don't, I don't want to be in education. I just think, that I think this should be part of the public sector with the private sector in local areas getting involved in contributing in a way, but it needs to be public sector. And and I worry that, you know, because we've done it, that people now will just, we don't need to help. It, it can't work being privately. It's got to be part of the education system of Scotland. Susan Mawson. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to a point that Jackie made about that, that idea of informal skills development. And I think that's that's a critical element. I see I see so many people who have come into to higher education or further education late um, for a whole number of different reasons. And, and, and I'm very lucky to see them when I do. Conversely, I see quite a lot of, of, of younger entrepreneurs who haven't gone through that route. And, and all of them are lacking this confidence. Lacking, they're, they're not lacking ambition. They're not lacking skills in any way. They're, they're lacking confidence. And to a certain extent, there is some skills development that's needed there, but they are very reluctant to go to, to formal mentoring sessions, to engage with a university, to go to college, to be part of a, a, a local business group because they perceive it as being this, this high pressure, very professionalized environment. And I think if we can, can integrate skills development in a more casual, informal, peer-to-peer -peer learning kind of way, we may be able to, to, to sort of address two key issues, both helping in terms of specific skills or specific knowledge bases, but also building that confidence without making people feel feel like they don't fit in and, and, and they're not polished enough to be in a, a particular training course. And I, I think anything that, that, that we can do to try and, and integrate that will be really helpful um, for, for lots of different disadvantaged groups, as, as well as those who are, are doing really well, as the case may be. And Sandy Kennedy, perhaps last word. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> for everybody's sake. A last um, word for today. For today. Um, really just building on Suzanne's point is that... Um, I'm touched on in many places. It's the hero of the story is the person who's out there trying to start a business, grow a business, um, who's creating the culture to do fair work and all of these different things. So we need to do everything we can to gather around them and support them in the most efficient way, be it from finance to, to support. Um, and then just really building on the very last point, which is that as a country, we don't invest enough in our leaders or the next future sets of leaders. And, and they don't invest maybe enough in themselves. And therefore, the more we can encourage that sense of continual lifelong learning for those people who either are leaders or potentially could be leaders, that would be a huge step forward. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to all of our witnesses for coming in. I'll suspend the meeting at this stage. We'll move into private session.